welcome to another episode of Jim's Love Garden. Okay, so it's always this time of year, uh, which is really good for going out to garden centres because you'll find loads of um, bargains and stuff like that. And one of the one of the biggest things to get at this time of the year is um, seeds, and seeds are will be available from all sorts of um, sort of garden centres and seed outlets. And uh, what you can be doing is if you can forward plan to what you want to do next year, you really can save yourself a fortune. And it's also good to go through the seeds at this time of year anyway, because you know you'll be able to see things that possibly you wouldn't have grown and uh, you'll be able to pick them up a lot cheaper now all of these seeds that I've got here the six packets of seeds here, I just want to quickly show you um, I picked all of these up from the um, my local garden centre for 50p um, a packet and these are normally well basically three pound a packet you can pick them up for um, 50p a packet at this time of year and uh, you know the the, the dates on them are still good obviously these are these are some peppers that I've got hold of, and these are, uh, for example, these seeds are good um, to be used right up until December 2019. So, you know, they've been only 16 now, obviously 17, 2017 next year. These are uh, going to be at least two years in date when I use them. So there's no reason why um, you can't go and, you know, buy seeds now for next year. Save yourself a small fortune, obviously, because if I've, you know, this is potentially 3, 6, 9, 12... 15, um, 18, so there's basically um, 18 pounds worth of seeds there and I've spent three. So I've saved myself 15 pounds just by buying these six packets. So what I've bought, uh, the first one, sweet peppers. Now these are from um, these are from Thompson and Morgan um, and these are the variety colour for the summer salad, um, summer salad mix it's called basically. So there are the seeds. Um, I've got to be honest with you, I don't normally grow peppers. I've grown peppers a few times in the past and I never, in all honesty, I never have fantastic results with peppers. But because I'm going to bring uh, my second greenhouse back in, back into service uh, next year, I'm going to have plenty of um, greenhouse space. So I thought, well, I might as well give it another go and um, see, how the, um, see how they fare next year. So what I'm going to be doing is growing some of these. I had looked at a couple of packets, but these, these are the ones that seem to be sort of most suited to what, you know, why we eat, um, or what we use peppers for. These are nice, sweet ones that can be either eaten raw or cooked. Most of which, you, you know, you can eat raw anyway. But um, that's the first one. Um, and these are sweet pepper salad mix. Um, and I'll be planting them um, sort of next, uh, March, April time, and I'll and I'll put a video out when I plant them anyway. But uh, that's one that I'll be growing next year. Um, so that's 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 one of the sort of more unusual ones. Um, two other unusual ones. Um, this this one is again from Thompson and Morgan, um, and these are strawberries. I have never grown strawberries, normal strawberries. I've grown the Alpine strawberries from seed before, as I explained a couple of weeks ago. But uh, these are a variety called um, um, Florian F1 Hybrid. Now all of the all of the um, strawberry plants that I've got out here, I've basically inherited, and I've always grown them on from runners, like I explained to you the other day. So what I do is I take take runners and then pop them up like that, and then plant these again next year. That's what I've always done in the past. So what I'm going to be doing with these is um, sowing sowing these um, really early next year in January and hopefully I'll be able to grow these on the greenhouse, plant them out into the uh, the strawberry plot when I've got it all sorted out and um, I'll have a, another variety of um, strawberries. So I've never grown from seed before so I'm going to give those a go. Again, I mean these are actually £4 a packet. Um, again, good till December 2019. So um, I've saved myself £3.50 just by buying these. But um, so I'm going to be growing some um, strawberries from seed next year. Another unusual, 
um, plant, which I've, I've not grown these before, and these are asparagus peas. Um, and they're, they're supposed to be quite a nice, um, nice sort of gourmet vegetable to grow. Um, so I thought I'd give these a go. Now these are um, basically you plant them in the in the uh, the spring. Uh, where does it say? So you sow out March, March, March to April, and then you harvest these from July to September. So I thought I'd give them a go. I've never grown these before, um, and um, they, they look a little bit unusual, but I'll see how they go. So that's asparagus peas. Again, three pound a packet. I've only paid fifty p. Um, right. And some of the more um, standard vegetables that I always grow. Um, this is the this is the curly kale that I always grow. Um, this is the, uh, this is called um, Reflex F1 Hybrid. And with the with the curly kale, I always get this is again from Thompson and Morgan. Um, I always get an F1 variety because then you know what you're gonna basically what you know you, you know you know what you're gonna get. The things with F1 hybrids. Um, as I've explained before, I'll just very quickly go through it again. Um, with F1 hybrids, if you grow things that that, that, that you crop all in one go, like um, um, like like cauliflowers or like um, broccoli or you, you know sort of plants like that, where you where it's a one shot harvest. Um, if you are going to grow an F1 hybrid grow some other types as well so you know grow two or three different varieties the reason being is f1 hybrids because they're all identical plants they are likely to um to all come to harvest at the same time so you're going to get a glut of vegetables all in one go whereas if you grow a non-f1 hybrid um you know you're going to get plants um coming to um, harvest in, in in stages obviously what you can do is is progressively plant um, so plant some um, seeds and then two three weeks later plant some more seeds and sort of progressively um, go through you know like two or three months like that um, and then and then you'll get like a staged harvest as well but uh, most certainly if you are going to grow um, any vegetable if it's not um, if it's the type of vegetable where you harvest everything in one go uh, be careful growing f1s because everything's going to come together obviously if you grow in small volumes you don't need to worry about that but where i grow sort of 20, 30, 40, 50 of each plant, uh, you know, you can get all your crop coming together. The things with kale is you're constantly picking leaves off. So, you know, you haven't got to harvest this all in one go. So even though the plants will all be identical and, you know, I can I can pull the leaves off um, as I go along. And um, and I think as well with, um, with, um, with kale, um, you know, you're not, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of different types of kale. But uh, the curly kale, to be honest with you, I, I grow this one every year. This year it's quite tough and it's because of the weather we've had. We've had quite a dry year. So uh, the leaves I found are quite tough. So rather than taking out the larger leaves around the outside, what I've actually started to do is take some of the younger leaves from the inner, uh, the inner part of the plant. Not the head, just the, you know, the younger leaves. And I've found that uh, they're a little bit better, but it's not as good as it is normally um, with the kale. But uh, anyway, that's the kale. Two others, um, and these are... Um, sort of money in the bank really. Um, the first one is from uh, Mr. Fothergill, um, Alicante uh, tomatoes. Now I grew these for the second time um, this year and they've grown really well. Um, there's actually some behind the camera now that I've still to harvest. But um, Alicante are really good tomatoes. However, what has got the edge in my estimation is uh, Moneymaker. Now Moneymaker is the is the tomato I always grow every year, and this side of the greenhouse here was um, had about 15 plants of um, money maker. And to be honest with you, I always find you can't go wrong. The reason I've bought, um, I'm going to show you how to save tomato seeds anyway. But uh, the reason I've bought these, apart from the fact that they were they were only 50p a packet, when you've got multiple types of tomatoes in a greenhouse, like I've had four varieties this year. They will cross pollinate with each other, and so what you get next year won't necessarily be what what plant you're taking it from. So if I take a, a money maker tomato off a, a money maker plant, obviously um, those seeds aren't necessarily going to come true. So um, I've I've bought these, so I have definitely got sort of true money maker. Now uh, money maker is a really old variety. You know, it's been about, to my knowledge, for 50, 60 years at least. And Alicante was derived from Moneymaker, so these two varieties are very, very similar. You know, they're all sort of. Um, I can show you this one. Here. 
what you're going to end up with is um, you know some some really nice tomatoes, kind of that size. That's the average kind of size for a um, money maker on Alicante. They're pretty much the same. There are I have had comments in the past that um, people say that the uh, the flavour of a an Alicante is better than a money maker. I've got to be honest with you. Uh, for the last couple of years, I've been eating both. I'll grow um, about a dozen or so plants of Alicante and about 15, 16 plants of Moneymaker. And if I cut the two tomatoes up and eat them, I honestly can't tell the difference. In, in all intents and purposes, it's the same tomato, in, in all honesty. I can't detect a, a difference in flavour. If, if anything, I would say that the, the Moneymaker is a heavier cropper, but there's, again, there's not a lot in it. They are, they are pretty much the same thing. So those are the, um, the tomatoes. But as I say, what I will be doing is showing you how to collect seeds from tomatoes. And um, if you're not too bothered about the uh, the crop you get next year, obviously, if you take, because um, I've had, um, here I had the, the, the Rainbow F1 tomatoes, then I had uh, Moneymaker tomatoes there, then I had Alicante behind the camera, and then just to the left of the camera, um, or just to the right as you're looking at me, um, was the um, Gardener's Delight. And um, but if you if if you're not too fussed about what you get next year, there's no reason why you can't save yourself uh, a couple of pounds and and save the tomato seeds out of a tomato and then grow them on for next year and uh, you, you know you'll be all right. One other thing I did buy yesterday, um, and this comes highly recommended, particularly if you're going to plant any shrubs long term. Um, it, I I did an experiment last year uh, with this stuff, and um, I I didn't get remarkably different um, results. And to be honest with you, I think, um, well, if I explain what it is, this is microhydral fungi. And when I, for example, when I planted the, um, the grapevine, I used this uh, three years ago. Um, and that's on, that's on the video if you look back. But um, microhydral fungi is a, is a naturally um, occurring fungus which is in the ground. Um, it's it's everywhere, but if you've got ground that's been um, used for horticulture for any given amount of time, and the ground's constantly being sort of churned up and ploughed and all the rest of it, there is going to be a lot of microhydral fungi in the ground. Um, it will be in hedgerows and and sort of places like that, places that haven't been dug over too much. Now the thing, the the good thing about microhydral fungi is it's a it's a fungus which 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 basically um, lives with a plant's root systems. It's, it's, it's within the ground and it's naturally occurring and um, basically what it does is it, it provides, it takes nutrients from the ground um, and gives them to the plant. In exchange the plant will give um, starch or um, uh, well, well basically starch, to sugars basically to the microbes of fungi. Funguses cannot produce um, starch uh, or sugar basically which is what they need to survive so funguses will always grow on a plant or, or off something else so they basically uh, they live together with another plant um, but the but there is a beneficial um, thing for your um, plants where what it will do is the microbial fungi will send out like just like roots but much thinner uh, a network of um, roots under the ground and it will bring all of the nutrients from a considerably wider and deeper area to a, a plant or a shrub or a tree or, or whatever, feeding all of those good nutrients into the plant. Now, if you're going to plant um, uh, either a tree or a shrub, or uh, particularly things like roses and things like that, will always benefit um, from microbes and fungi. And you're not going to disturb the ground, which is an important point. Um, it's it's well worthwhile you um, putting in microbes and fungi in there. And what that will do is it will. Um, Basically, you dust the roots of the plant as you put it into the ground, and then that microhydra fungi will then go onto the root, and then it'll spread out, and it'll feed, um, it'll feed the plant with all the goodness from the ground. Now, if you imagine, you know, we've all seen sort of cross-sectional um, diagrams of a tree where you've got basically the same underground as you, as you have on the top of the ground, but you imagine what you've got underground, the root system. You imagine that going out four or five times more. Than it would do normally, and that's basically what microbial fungi will do. It'll it'll almost um, extend the roots by four or five times what the normal plant would do. So as you can imagine, you can get that much more goodness into the plant, and uh, the starch or the sugar that the plant gives back to the fungus is nothing in comparison to what the fungus brings to the plant. So.
The good news is that was a pound from the, the garden centre and our garden centre was selling these off. They had, they had, they had quite a lot of it. It's, it's something that can be stored for you know, quite a while. You know, you, you can, once opened, you need to keep it in the fridge. But um, whilst it's, it's, it's kind of freeze dried in there, and um, that'll, that'll, that'll be good for a few years. Um, so that'll, that'll stay live in there. And obviously when I need it next year, I can put it out. Um, you're not to put this on brassicas. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's one stipulation with, with um, vegetables. You can put this on pretty much everything. It works best with, um, it works best with uh, plants that's not going to be moved um, because it takes, a, it takes a while for it to establish itself in the ground. And if you're going to be digging the ground, you're basically destroying all of the, you know, you, you, you know, you're chopping it all up. So things like, um, if you're going to put a, um, things like herbs that are going to be in, 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 a, in a piece of ground for any, any given time, strawberries, um, uh, rhubarb or asparagus, plants like that that are going to stay in a given position for a long amount of time, um, it's well worthwhile you putting these in. Um, and anything like fruit bushes, trees, fruit trees, you know, your, your raspberries, your, your gooseberries and stuff like that. Um, it's well worthwhile you putting some of this in the ground. So basically all you need to do is dig the ground um, where you're going to put the plant and then uh, dig your hole and then just before you put the plant in, plant into the hole, just, just rough the roots up a little bit, you, you know, take it out of the pot, rough the roots up a little bit and then sprinkle a bit of this on onto the roots and some into the hole as well and then plant your plant your shrub in there or your bush wherever and then that will then um, um, attach itself to the plant's roots and then it'll help the plant to grow that much better so if you do see any of this do give it a go um, particularly if you want your plants to establish quickly and remain strong and healthy Mark Riles and Fungi um, gets the gets a thumbs up from me so uh, all of these things you, you know you can be looking out at garden centres that's really the main message so look out you know there's all sorts of tools and um, you know all, all, all sorts of fleeces and um, fertilizers compost seeds and you know microhazel fungi and all that kind of stuff which is um, on offer now um, at garden centers because they're trying to clear it all out so they can bring the Christmas stuff in um, you know it's well worthwhile you um, going to going along to your garden center and see what um, bargains and um, things you can pick up this time of year Okay, I did have a comment about the um, uh, the grapevine, and I've, I know I've not done many clips or comments on it over the, over this year. But I just thought I'd quickly let you know how was how things were going on. The one that was on this side, unfortunately, which was the the dark red one, unfortunately that died. I was hoping that it was going to shoot again from the the root stock, but unfortunately it hasn't. So uh, what I will be doing um, is is getting getting another. Um, get another vine to go on this side but this one here has done really well the leaves are starting to sort of brown now because of the temperature so they are um, starting to die back but um, it's grown quite well this year and I have been trimming it back quite a lot so I get a lot of these runners um, forming on the uh, on the uh, the plant so what I've been doing is sort of chopping these back to try and get it more sort of bush like it just tend to take over the greenhouse a little bit um, but as you can see all of these all of these leaves are now starting to sort of go brown and obviously you know we you know we're sort of getting into sort of autumn time so what I will be doing is waiting for all of the all of the green to go out the leaves so all of the goodness is going from the leaves into the actual plant so um, uh, don't be tempted to take these leaves off until they've gone absolutely brown and, and to be honest with you they are likely to fall off when they're ready anyway so uh, you know don't be tempted to try and pull them off even though they're going like this because the um, the goodness from the tree uh, the, the leaves is basically going back into the plant for uh, for next year so um, but anyway um, so it has grown really well I've now got these two main runners as you can see there's one there and one there and that goes all the way to the end um, I've even got some otters up here look. Um, this goes all the way to the end of the greenhouse and I've just cut that one off there uh, that's the end of that one and then the other one that's the, that's the end of the other one there basically it branches off at the end and what I've been doing is trimming back all of the, um, the shoots um, from the, um, the vine and um, you know just, just keeping it in trim now hopefully next year I will get some, um, some fruits off it but the, basically what I had this year was I had about uh, eight or nine little bunches of grapes forming and if you look at the earlier clips that I put out um, you'll see that what I did is I trimmed them back so there was um, I think there was four or five 
bunches of grapes going along the vine. Unfortunately we had a snap of cold weather and um, they all basically got nobbled by the, um, by the cool snap and um, they basically fell off so I got no grapes at all off it this year. Hopefully next year I'll get my first crop off it. Uh, but that's what the grapevine looks like at the moment and as soon as I've um, what I will do at the end of the year is um, take all these leaves out and I'll, I'll trim it back because there are, there are some sort of longer shoots um, going all over the place like this one here look um, it's a little bit it's getting a little bit busy up here so these these sort of longer shoots here I'll cut them back um, to just just to this you know these two main runners um, and, w and when I do that I'll do just do a quick do um, I'll do a quick video so you can see what's going on but that's what the grapevines look like at the moment okay I've not done a um, an allotment tour um, for five or six weeks now so I just thought I'd quickly take you around uh, the comfrey as you can see um, I've tied that up but it's still still sort of growing but what I've been doing is chopping bits off that and putting it in this bin here for next year. Um, you have seen clips of the um, birdhouse gourd, but as you can see the, um, the vines are now really dying back these two, so what I will be doing is cropping the, uh, the birdhouse gourds off and put, take them inside to dry, but they've, they've grown really well this year. The herbs will be cut back in the next few weeks, but um, as you can see, this mint is now really sort of dying back. And you do that to protect the, uh, the, the roots of the plant, because during the winter you'll get snow on here, it'll weight down, and the wind will blow it backwards and forwards. So you're much better off cutting it all off at the ground, and then you know, you'll, you'll um, spur more growth on um, um, next spring. Now the, the sage in exactly the same way, I'll cut that down so it's about a foot tall, just to give the plant a little bit more structure and um, so the wind doesn't blow it about as well but that's what the sage looks like um, as you can see this mint here that I cut down a couple of weeks ago is, is already starting to send up new little shoots here as you can see that's the stuff that got cut down the um, oregano for some reason all the little green shoots on there died off I'm not quite sure why um, there are still shoots on it so I'm, I'm sure the plant's still alive but um, the oregano that I didn't cut down has done pretty much the same, so I'm, I'm sure that it's not the the fact that I've cut it down, it's gone like that. But uh, that's what the herb border looks like. The the ochre, as you can see, looks very much like it did the other day. If anything, it's grown a little bit more. But um, I'm hoping for some uh, nice little ochre tubers off there to eat over Christmas. Um, here, the asparagus, the, the, uh, the comfrey's went wild a bit here to be honest with you so what I need to do is build some kind of structure here to hold it back next year um, I think I'll put some of the um, the uh, the netting off the Harris fencing along there just to try and keep it keep it out of the way of the asparagus but uh, the asparagus is still growing um, what I will do is um, cut that all back um, in the next few weeks as well because the wind's going to start blowing that about um, they're the chives that we moved at the beginning of the year and uh, they're still they're still going all right uh, you saw the raspberries last time, and they're still growing quite nicely. We're still getting, still getting uh, some good fruits on there, uh, which we're picking. Um, right along the fruit trees, um, and uh, obviously you've seen the um, birdhouse gourds along here. Uh, the fruit trees are growing really well this year, and the bushes and that. Um, they'll need to be, um, again, tidied up a little bit towards the end of the year. And um, I'm about to pick the apples off that tree at the end there. But... Um, but yeah, the the fruit trees are establishing themselves in there and doing all right. The potatoes I've dug out pretty much all of these now, and uh, I'm just digging them up as I've uh, needed them. But um, I am starting to find that I'm getting quite a bit of slug damage in them now, so um, I need to find the time and dig the rest of these out. But uh, as I say, you know, um, the the potatoes I've done pretty well this year. Um, I've picked all the beans off there um, for seed for next year, and. Um, this is the um, um, the colour. Well, I've actually weeded um, that end there, but um, I need to get along here. But um, I'm hoping these are like the little potato, um, little potato um, type um, plants that I'll be um, I'll be showing you um, in a few weeks' time when I dig those up. Um, right, just moving around here. Sweet peas. I've taken some seed off already, but I do need to get some more. But as you can see, they are naturally dropping the seed now. So I need to get in there. Now this is the this is the Petrage kale um, and the um, Scottish kale. So 
that's the petrage kale at the back there, these, these big plants. And the, this is probably, um, probably it's about five and a half foot high now. Um, but you can see, you know, they are really good plants. Um, I can see I've got a bit of white fly on them. But um, nothing too, I'm not too worried because we're going to have a, the weather's going to get colder soon and that'll kill them off. But um, as you can see, this, this black, this black here, that's um, basically coming off the, coming off the white fly. But, uh, you know, if I, if I don't need to use spray, um, I, um, I basically, um, or, or I can find a natural way of doing something, then um, I'll always, you know, opt to do that. But uh, as I say, these were, these were sent through to me from Richard Sydenham, um, the seeds, and uh, they have grown really well. They most certainly like uh, the soil here. But, um, so I'll be starting to crop this um, in the near future. Um, this is the um, curly kale up at the front here. Um, and the, uh, this is the Aztec broccoli, which we get quite a lot of. That's now run to seed. As you can see, there's seed everywhere, really. But, uh, and then just down the back there, I don't know if you can see, but there is some more, um, there is some more um, curly um, kale as well, uh, which are basically the seeds I showed you in the previous clip. But, uh, but yeah, so the, this brassica cage this year has done me proud. Um, it's, it's still in one piece and um, it's um, stopped any uh, butterflies getting in here. As you can see, there's no, there's no butterfly damage in any of this. So uh, it's done its job. Um, there's, some, there's some white fly, but I'm not too concerned about that. So that's the first tunnel. Uh, right, moving into the bit further down. Um, mainly weeds now, to be honest with you. This is where the onions was, uh, were. That's got chickweed all over it, so what I do is I'll, I'll get all this chickweed up and feed it to the chickens, basically. Um, but I didn't weed this before because all of the um, butternut squashes and that were going everywhere. These are the um, parsnips doing well, and we've still got quite a few um, beetroot in there. The leeks haven't done brilliantly, to be honest with you. However, having said that, I should have weeded them out a lot sooner than I did. These are, um, these are the um, swede. As you can see, they're, they're growing quite, quite well. Um, I need to thin them out a little bit really, but uh, there are some there are some good sized ones. These are the first ones to go in, but uh, they're not too bad when they're small because what you can do is you can pull them out and just have a few of those at a time. These are some more, these are turnips here. As you can see I have already picked some of these, but uh, these are nice when they're small. Again there's some more beetroot here, um, but the, the, uh, the rows up there, if you can see them between the, uh, between the weeds, um, they didn't grow particularly well because I had the, that beetle come through again. And exactly the same as this second row here of, um, of Swede, they, um, they had the beetle go through them as well. So um, this, this first row here was grown in modules, put in, and I had no problem with that at all. Um, even though I've got a little bit of slug damage on them now. Um, or caterpillar damage, I'm not quite sure what that is. Um, but this row here was seeded and um, basically it was no good so next year I'm most certainly going to grow them in modules and then plant them but uh, sorry about the weeds, you'll have to excuse them I've not had a chance to uh, weed uh, the, the, uh, the rhubarb's come up again as you can see this is the second, second um, harvest of, um, um, of, of rhubarb and uh, it's, it's not grown quite as well as it normally does but, um, but still it's done pretty well um, this is the second tunnel, and I shan't go in there, but basically I've got some more um, Scottish kale in there from Richard, and I've got spinach um, in these two rows here, and I've, got, I've had quite a lot of spinach from there. These are the sunflowers which have now finished, I need to take the heads off them and get the seeds, and all of these calanges along the front here have finished, I need to get all of those out. This was the pumpkin patch, um, as you can see, that's pretty much gone now, I've got rid of most of the, the actual plants themselves. But um, there's still a few um, courgettes left over there. But uh, what I'll be doing with this um, is basically taking everything off um, the ground in the next few weeks, digging all the weeds out, and um, basically um, sort of clearing the ground ready for the uh, for the winter. That's the mashua um, plant. This is like a, it's very similar to ochre. Um, it's like a small carrot, probably about four inches long, and it's white with like purple purple bits on it. Um, they're um, they're basically what what you eat is is sort of buried in the ground, so you know it actually grows in the ground. This is just the top of it. Um, so they've grown really well this year, as you can see. 
um, up, up that framework. So um, I will be uh, digging those up in the not too distant future. Uh, basically, what you need to do is wait for a frost, then all the top dies off, then you dig out, dig out the uh, you know what's under the ground, and I'll and I'll show you what that looks like when I dig it out. Um, these are the runner beans, and as you can see, they're all running to seed now. So what I will be doing is picking these seeds off in the not too distant future. There are still some still um, coming here, these beans here, but um, you, you know, by far the majority of them have now run over. So what I'll be doing is taking these off and um, shelling them all. And what I will be doing is eating the seeds um, just to give them a go. I'll put them in some stews and that, but uh, I've left them on here to, uh, to ripen off and I'll be taking these seeds out. Um, but as I say, you know, I am still getting flowers. Uh, the weather's mild enough um, and the plants are still going. So I am getting some beans. Uh, there are some young beans on here look, that can be just taken off the plant and eaten straight away. But uh, basically my freezer's full, I can't go any more in there. So I'm just eating them straight away onto the... Uh, what's that? This is the This is the other side. Um, and there's a mixture of the um, Aloco. Um, there's, um, there's green, there's green, pink, yellow and pink, yellow and orange um, in here, but the Aluko will be dug up in the not, not too distant future and I'll show you what they look like, but basically you eat them like potatoes and uh, first time I've grown these this year um, you are supposed to be able to eat the, the foliage as well but um, I was reluctant to take any of the foliage off because um, I wanted the, the, the tubers to form um, under the ground as opposed to eating them, so next year what I'll probably do is grow them again I don't think the ground is rich enough for them. What I need to do is put a lot more muck and um, sort of compost in the ground, and because um, I don't think they've grown quite as well as they possibly could have done this year. But that's that's a lesson learned for next year. I will put a load more stuff in there, and I'll also mulch the ground as well because I think they're quite moisture-loving plants. Uh, coming up this side here, this is the uh, this is the other side of the, the fruit tree. As you can see, these are the these are the gourds. That's a, that's a really good sized one there. Um, some smaller ones here, which you've seen before. And then the strawberry patch. Um, I have actually got strawberries, I don't know if you can see them in there. Uh, but what I've been doing is, um, I've been pulling out all of the, the bindweed and stuff out of the um, strawberry patch as much as possible. The roots are still obviously there, but what I'll be doing is, um, I didn't want the, the bindweed to get any stronger than it already was. Uh, but what I'm going to be doing with this is digging it all out and uh, cleaning the uh, the area and then um, I'll be I'll be uh, refreshing that with uh, some some uh, some fresher um, strawberry plants and um, getting that all ready for next year. So that's what the um, the plot looks like at the beginning of October. So I hope this episode has been some news to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions you've got below, and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode. Jim's love the garden.